Hi, everyone. My name is Shiv Gaglani, and I'm co-founder and CEO of Osmosis. Uh, my colleague Ryan and I started Osmosis while we were medical students at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we were actually in the same team-based learning group in anatomy. And uh, the purpose of this webinar is to help you kind of understand how best to balance class-based studying and board-based studying, because I know if you're like most medical students, whether you're a first year, or second year, or even third year, um, you may find it challenging to, to kind of balance all the different requirements coming at you. And so <clears throat> just some ground rules for the webinar. Um, this will be recorded and we'll send it out. And uh, so you'll get that through the email system. Uh, <clears throat> we also, um, uh, normally the internet works pretty well, but if I, if I get cut off, we'll send a message and then try resuming the webinar where we left off. Um, finally, on the events page where you RSVP'd, there is a Q&A option, so you can just simply uh, ask a question there, and I should be able to get it, um, and then um, and then respond. So, as as mentioned, um, I'm Shiv. I'm co-founder of Osmosis, and uh, Osmosis was something that um, my colleague Ryan and I started uh, literally a, a semester into medical school, and it was to solve two problems that we found as medical students ourselves. The first problem is a problem that a lot of systems try solving, which is that of retention. You know, you're learning so much information in med school, how do you retain it? Uh, you know, it's pretty, it's relatively easy to first get it in your head, but then you'll forget it pretty soon after. Um, and so we decided to take a lot of the proven cognitive techniques, ranging from spaced repetition to test enhanced learning to memory associations, and put that all into one system, uh, which is what osmosis is. But the second problem, and really the problem that's the title of this webinar, um, that we were trying to solve was the problem of trying to balance these different curricula. So I'm going to, going to try screen sharing and hopefully you'll be able to see my screen. Second. Okay. I'm going to present that to everyone. So this is the issue, and, and again, hopefully most of you see this. If you don't, please use the Q&A um, in the events page uh, to notify me that you don't see the screen. But so essentially, medical education is really spread out into a number of different curricula that you're responsible for. Um, these are separated into classwork, so the things that your school is trying to teach you. You know, the, ultimately you'll get a diploma from, a, from your school, and um, that's based on the fact that you passed all their requirements, um, as well as the national requirements like the board exams. But so you'll get these professors who have MDs or PhDs or, or, or other credentials, and they'll be giving you these weekly or monthly exams for their blocks, say a cardiovascular exam for the cardiology block. Um, and so ultimately you have to pass that with say a 70% or above at, at most schools in order to even advance to the next course or next semester. So that's the first requirement you have, the classwork. Then come second year or in some schools your third year, then you have to really start worrying about the board exams. For example, the USMLE step one and the COMLEX. And oftentimes schools recognize that this causes a lot of stress and that they're really important for your eventual placement into a residency. So they'll give you dedicated time off, you know, anywhere from two to eight weeks off is what I've heard for your dedicated step studying time. And ultimately, if you were able to really learn things during your classwork, the board studying time is, is less stressful because you've got it down. But again, remember one of the problems was retention. I apologize. Give me a second. I'm just getting a call in, I'm trying to figure out who that is. Okay, well, I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, okay, hopefully that doesn't happen again. So as I was saying, you have your class-based material, then you have your board curriculum, and then you have obviously the clinical experience curriculum. So that's what you typically do during your rotations and then into residency and beyond. The things that you need to know to actually be a good clinician. And ideally, these three buckets, classwork, board exams, and clinical experience would all overlap. But in practice, that's harder uh, to do. It's easier said than done. An example of that is, uh, you know, we, when we were at Hopkins, we had a lecture on telomeres. And this was actually given by one of the three Nobel laureates who helped discover telomeres. And it was, a, you know, obviously a fantastic opportunity to learn from somebody who, who literally discovered telomeres. The problem was a lot of students, this was our second year, knew that telomeres were not so-called high yield for the board exams. So people tended to skip this lecture until they made it mandatory, which was a shame because you know most of us understood that the reason we were paying a lot of money was to connect with faculty and learn from the best, but we were skipping a lecture from a Nobel laureate, laureate on telomeres because telomeres aren't very frequently tested on the board exams. 
So that's an example of how there's a class-based requirement to learn about telomeres, but the board exams don't test that much on it, so there was a tension there. Another tension is that, obviously, if any of you have been hearing the news, Zika virus is, is getting to be very concerning and probably will be more concerning as of next month after the Olympics, uh, when you have a lot of people traveling um, to and from Brazil and, and maybe picking up Zika virus. <clears throat> It'll be a little while before Zika virus shows up in the board exams or the classwork, but certainly if you're in the clinic, um, you'll be getting uh, questions from concerned patients, specifically if you're in the obstetrics or, or ob clinic, you'll, you'll definitely be getting questions about Zika virus. And so this is an example where there's something that you need to know to be a good clinician, namely Zika virus and, and things about that, but that probably won't be tested on the boards anytime soon or even taught in your classes because a lot is not, not yet known about it. So to summarize, for those of you joining a bit late, essentially what we just described was that you know, a medical student really has three curricula that they have to balance. There's the stuff that your class, uh, your your professors in your school are teaching you. There's the stuff that the NBME or NBOME require for the US Assembly and COMLEX exams. And then there's the stuff that you need to be a good clinician. And in general, we want to see a lot of overlap. But in practice, you'll notice that there isn't as much overlap as you'd like. And so this was one of the big problems we identified as medical students, and we decided to start tackling. And our approach to this whole problem was that, you know, what if we could take, instead of skipping class, instead of, um, you know, ignoring the material that our professors were giving us, because we ultimately were paying a lot of money to go to, to, go to this med, med school, what if we could take that material, whether it was that lecture on telomeres, for example, or a lecture on sickle cell anemia, and then analyze the text of that material, similarly to what, um, you know, Facebook does when they analyze some of the stuff that you write or post. What if we analyze the material and then we're able to recommend, say, a board-relevant quiz based on that material or a uh, pathophysiology video that could help you understand that material faster? So essentially, our I whole idea was to take the technologies that companies like Facebook and Netflix are using and then uh, apply that to medical education. And if there, those of you are interested, I'll actually share this link with you. We published a paper about this in the Annals of Internal Medicine that was literally called, What Can Medical Education Learn from Facebook and Netflix? And in it, we talk about how these companies have really sophisticated algorithms that understand what type of, you know, who your friends are. They understand what type of, you know, in the case of Amazon, they know what, what you want to shop for. You know, customers who bought this also bought that. In the case of Netflix, people who watch this also like to watch that. So those kind of algorithms that can intelligently recommend content to you we wanted to bring to medical education, as well as a um, sophisticated um, user interface that would let you do a lot of things without you feeling like you're doing a lot of things. Anyways, I'll post a link to this article in case some of you are interested in reading it, but it essentially talks about the vision for being able to use technology to bridge that gap between what your professors are teaching you and what's expected in the board exams and for clinical practice. So with that, I'm going to um, just remind anyone, because uh, it seems like a bunch of people joined uh, a little late, um, that if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to use the Q&A app um, that is on the events page. It's the Q&A button right on the, on the thumbnail. Uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to try answering those questions, especially near the end. So again, balancing these three curricula and trying to use technology uh, like Facebook and Netflix type uh, machine learning and natural language processing to figure out what you're learning, when you're learning it, and how we can make it board and, and ward relevant. So with that, I'm going to go into an actual osmosis group to show you, because many of you heard about this through the context of osmosis. Um, essentially, what I'm showing you here is this is a specific preclinical group. This is actually Ross Medical School. I'm showing you this one because we have a great relationship with that school, as well as and a ton of users there, as well as um, the fact that most schools right now are on summer break. At Ross, since they have three intake classes every year, there's actually a whole group of students who started in May, so just two months ago, and they, they are expected to graduate in 2020. And so they're actively in the thick of class-based studying, right? They're two months into med school. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick tour and then show you how you can balance uh, class-based and board studying through specific features. So what you're seeing here, again, is a private group, just like a Facebook group, only available to Ross students in that specific cohort. And we're in the Lectures tab. There's also Library, Quizzes, and if you're an Administrator, Analytics. You can ignore that for now. 
So under lectures, there's a couple options. Um, you can see on the right, there's a calendar. So it's July, obviously, and today is July uh, 6th, it's Wednesday. You can see that there's two blue dots here, meaning there's two lectures. So this is literally, um, these are literally the lectures that the Ross students in this cohort had today. So they first had a lecture on the development of male and female reproductive systems, and then they had a lecture on iron, vitamin B12, and folic acid metabolism. And again, most of you watching this are medical students, so you probably can relate to this or will relate to it very soon, that you'll get inundated with lectures. There's a lot of blue dots here, whether it's lectures or TBLs or PBLs or clinical correlations or um, um, you know, other, other type sessions, you'll have a lot of stuff on your schedule that you're expected to get through to graduate, you know, to get, get past the first year and into the second year and beyond. What osmosis has done is it's given you this material front and center. So it actually takes your curriculum from your school, puts it into this private group that you can follow along with. Um, so that's similar to what you use right now. You, you may use GoodNotes or Notability or Dropbox to store and organize your material. It's also done on osmosis. And the way this material is populated is if we work with your school, the school will often populate it. But in most schools, it's um, literally one, one of you will send us a calendar. We'll upload the calendar to osmosis so it has all the events populated. And then you can simply drag and drop. So these, these dates, for example, there's a, um, on the 11th, there's, uh, actually, let me, let me find a better example. On the 15th, there's an anatomy lab. And if you click on that, then you can upload a document, drag and drop a document. And many of you have probably already done this. It takes literally a minute or two to process the document and do all the natural language processing to understand what you're learning. So back to the sixth. So we have these documents. And, and one really important note is that these documents, your class material is kept private. Only people in your class can see it. So there's no uh, worry about it going public or, or being disseminated beyond your classmates. Uh, we're very concerned about copyright and make sure that this is front and center. So anyways, this is uh, one professor's lecture on development of male and female reproductive system. So it's front and center, meaning that you can actually click right into it to take notes. This is very popu a popular way students study. And, and again, if you haven't started med school, you realize this is a, a good way to study where you can actually go into the document and you can start reviewing it. Some of you do this in PowerPoint. Some of you do this in OneNote. Most of you have obviously gone through many years of school to get to medical school in the first place. So you probably have a system in place to already do this. Um, one thing we've done with Osmosis though that makes it a bit unique is you're able to take notes right here and you can attach images and videos. So say you find a good video that shows an animation of, um, of sexual dimorphism, for example. You can find that, you can embed it, basically just attach it here and then everyone in your class then has access to it. Uh, it isn't necessarily something that only you found. Your notes are private, but your documents, uh, but your uh, YouTube videos and images are shared with the rest of the class. So it's a collaborative platform for finding and sharing resources too. Speaking of collaboration, you can also create flashcards and questions right alongside the document. And this is important because what we want to get you to, to do, and we'll do another webinar on this later, is you, you should start using more active learning approaches. Instead of just kind of blindly highlighting material, you want to start really thinking about what was said and then create a flashcard or a question to quiz yourself. This is something called the test, en test enhanced learning. Uh, and I'll go into that in another webinar. But so if you say create flashcard, it essentially allows you to just do a quick, you know, uh, create a quick flashcard right here. So um, I'm learning about sexual dimorphism, and you can literally just underline um, underline something to make a closed deletion. Some of you have heard about this, and you can just play around with this. But essentially, what's happening here is that um, you're able to take what your professors are giving you. Again, this is your curriculum, and you're able to actively learn by creating flashcards or questions, as well as using other students' material. You can see two students have already created material on this um, on this slide, and or actually four. You can see Andrea, Sarah, Ryan, and Gala have all created flashcards here. And if you use Twitter, you notice that you know we we appreciate the fact that there are some people in your study group that you really want to follow or not. Um, so you can actually follow some people. You can say, I want to follow Sarah's material. I, I really trust it, and um, and now it's in your queue. And as you go through it, you'll notice that again, this is your professor's material. And Gala has created a 
flashcard based on it, and it's based very much on this material. So I can just mouse over to test myself on this question, and now I can flag it for spaced repetition, which essentially means it's going to be tested. It's going to be sent to me the next day, and over a spaced repetition system to essentially mean uh, help me retain that knowledge. So, anyways, I'm going through this, um, and you notice again, there's more flashcards and questions I can quiz myself with, um, but right at the top here. This is something that actually was not produced by a fellow student. This is one example of how we help balance board and class studying. So again, on the left, this is your class curricular material. On the right, we've said, here's a, here's a potential board tested fact, flag it for a review. So essentially, we've analyzed the text of this document very quickly, and then we've said, hey, we have a bank of 15,000 flashcards that are all based on what you may see on the boards, specifically step one in Comlex. And we're going to recommend it right alongside your document automatically. So it's like you upload a document and you can automatically generate a quiz, a flashcard quiz or a question quiz based on what you just uploaded. Um, and you can see this is, this is obviously talking about um, genital ridge and, and various you know, mesonephric kidney, basically sexual development. And here it says, what is the first functional organ to form in vertebrate embryos? It's talking about, this, uh, talking about uh, development of um, a vertebrate embry embry embryos. Um, and in some cases, if you aren't happy with the match, you can say it's not removed or not relevant. But most of the time, it's quite good at identifying things that, whether or not they're immediately relevant to your course material, they're very relevant to the boards. These are things that map to first aid, for example. Uh, here's another example. We'll test it. So it says, which cells of the testes secrete testosterone? And you can mouse over, it's the Leydig cells. And the Leydig cells are, are kind of mentioned right here, that are derived from inter interstitial mesenchyme between cords. So <clears throat> again, you have curricular material, you have board relevant material. And then another thing you can do that's potentially of interest is you notice that some of these things are highlighted, as well as if you hover over things, like here I'm hovering over Leydig cell, and on the bottom left, you notice it says click to get Leydig cell. If I actually click it, it pops up. Um, it pops up a concept card. So we call this a concept card, where there's a summary, uh, you know, quick reference for Leydig cell, and it'll also show where in first aid this is covered. So this is something. If you haven't heard of first aid yet, it's you know they often say it's the the go-to manual for studying for the boards. Um, so it'll say you know if you have the 2016 edition or 2015 or 2014, you can use this, where you can see that Leydig cells are covered on page 571 and 576 of uh, first aid. You can also see that it's on, uh, related to testosterone. And there's some things called Leydig cell tumors, which you can look at at page 598. So you start seeing immediately that this concept that shows up in your curriculum is also relevant on first aid on the boards. And if you want to do a deep dive into Leydig cells, you can click on the flashcards. And here's eight, eight more flashcards that you can flag, you can test yourself on, and flag for spaced repetition um, that are all board relevant. So all these flashcards are board relevant. And the same thing, you can go through it this way, or you can say start quiz and take a quiz right here. One more thing that lets you really go down and dive into the roots of uh, if, how relevant this material is, is let me go to a different topic. I'll go to testosterone. So I click on testosterone. Here's the summary. Here's where it shows up in first aid. There's a bunch of cards about it. And if I click timeline, this essentially shows every single time in your curriculum, whether you're at University of Arizona, or Ross University, or Johns Hopkins, or LECOM, wherever you may be, this is your uh, curriculum that was uploaded to Osmosis, where you can see every time testosterone showed up. Um, and then you can actually, you know, here it shows Kleinfelter syndrome on June 7th. I can actually click on one of these slides and go right into that lecture uh, and load in a second. Um, <clears throat> there it is. So this, this itself is something that, that makes your organization much better. I know a lot of students like to organize things in Dropbox and GoodNotes and OneNote. Using Osmosis lets you have a full text searchable index of all your curricular documents that lets you then see how certain material relates to each other. Um, and that helps you, the more um, relationships you can draw between the material you're learning um, in the classroom between one module and another uh, module, the better, the, the more likely you are to remember it. And this will come back. I'll, I'll show you another version of this in, in a bit. So just to summarize here, we have a document that comes from your school that's kept in a private group. 
we enable you to take notes on it and study just like you would. One of our most requested features is highlighting and annotations. We're adding that in the next few weeks. So you'll be able to highlight and annotate on these slides as well. Um, you can create flashcards and questions alone or with your colleagues, and you can decide who you want to follow or not. And then every once in a while, we'll recommend um, osmosis relevant or a board relevant flashcards. Um, so again, here is another example where it'll say blank cells of the testes secrete MIF. And you can see it should be um, Sertoli cells. And you can see Sertoli cells are, are right here too. Um, so let me go out of the doc viewer. So this is the original view that you had seen where we have your curriculum, we have your calendar, and we have, um, actually, before I go on, there were two questions. We, we got one question from uh, Hesham about when uploading a lecture packet rendered as a photograph of the slide, uh, is there a way to insert words or topics related to lecture in order to trigger the language recognition software for board-related cards? So yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I'll answer that right now by saying, so when you upload a document, the types of documents that can be uploaded are PDF, PowerPoint, and uh, document. So .ppt, .doc, and .pdf, and then the, the X versions of those. Uh, Osmosis actually works best on text, um, right? That's what we're extracting. One issue is um, when you get a slide set that's all images and very little text, or, the t or even the text is image form, Osmosis actually doesn't extract that material. And so the best way to go about that is before you upload it is if in the uh, in the note section of the PowerPoint slide, if you add add a few keywords, that'll help you. That'll help seed the program with more text-based recommendations. But you actually don't even need Osmosis to recommend material because um, this is a, an, an added benefit of using Osmosis, where we will automatically recommend material. But you could just simply know that you're studying, say, um, you're studying diabetes, so you can just kind of search for diabetes in Osmosis. Um, like this, and then you'll get the recommendations right here. And I'll, I'll show you more about kind of what this concept card shows. So hopefully that helps answer um, Hesham's question right now. Um, and now the second question from Rachel is, can anyone in a group send you the calendar, or do we need to have an administrative status to do that? So uh, the nice thing is, if you're in a group, whether it's your private group, and you can create a private group with just your study team, just go to osmosis.org forward slash start. But uh, we recommend being in a school group because then you can collaborate uh, as a class, just like a Facebook group. Um, only one person has to upload a calendar and send us a calendar. This is easiest if it's sent to us as a .ics file, which can be exported from any learning management system or Google Calendar. And you can just, uh, one thing to mention is if you have any questions, just use this on the bottom right, this big question mark, and you can, um, you can start a conversation with us and ask us something. And we're pretty good about uh, responding within uh, you know a few minutes, if not some hours. Um, so only one person has to do that. You ideally don't need administrative status to do that because you have your own calendar, and that's part of what you're paying for by going to that school. Um, but we're happy to talk to your administrators as well to, to get that material and, and help get you set up. We work, one thing to mention is we work with 22 schools now. And so these are schools where the, the students at those schools are um, their osmosis kind of full Osmosis subscription. There's a lot of free stuff on Osmosis, but we have this thing called Osmosis Prime, which I'll explain um, later. Um, they basically, their, their schools pay for their Osmosis Prime access, um, which is great because you already pay a lot of money for tuition, so it's it's actually very cheap relatively to, to get Osmosis on top of that. And so we're happy to talk to your administrators about that kind of stuff. So moving on, um, and again, feel free to uh, ask more questions. Actually, Ezra just asked us a question about spaced repetition behind the board review note cards. It's a good question. So um, I did show you a couple of examples of where here we have, we're on the testosterone concept card, and you can see there's a bunch of facts here for testosterone. Um, when you mouse over and quiz yourself, you can you know do a quiz that way. Then you can flag it for spaced rep. So what spaced rep means, for those of you who don't know, is it basically was developed in the 1890s for learning languages. And over the past 100 years has, has evolved a bit because technology has allowed us to automate a lot of this. So essentially, if you get a flashcard today and you get it wrong, you're going to see it very soon, within 24 hours again, um, so that we can make sure that you get it right the next time. If you get it right, you'll see it maybe in three days or five days. 
We also have how long, how confident you are plays a role. So if you get it right with high confidence, it may come back in seven days. If you get it right with no confidence, then it may come back in two days. Um, so there's this algorithm that we have developed, um, improved upon. So there's a, Anki uses a very simple algorithm um, based off something called Super Memo. We actually got a grant from the National Board of Medical Examiners called a Stemler grant, where we're working with University of Illinois, Chicago, and University of Central Florida to improve the spaced repetition. Because uh, while I will cover this in another webinar briefly, you actually, you know, I would argue that you actually don't want, uh, you know, um, normal space rep for medical education and that's because of two reasons one is spaced repetition was developed for language learning and when you learn say the conjugate verb forms of French uh, you want to remember that forever but if you learn the frontline therapy for testicular cancer you don't want to know that forever because by the time you're a resident or a physician that may change so you don't want to have memorized it forever you just want to know it well enough for the next you know for as long as it's relevant and the second problem with space strap is it's not contextualized. So if you use Anki or Firecracker or one of these other space strap tools, you're essentially just getting this material sent to you um, on this uh, on this predictable algorithm. You aren't get it isn't it doesn't understand what you're learning in the curriculum. One thing we like to do with osmosis is say you learned about oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, um, and then you you answer a question about that. But then three days later, you actually have a lecture on cyclic anemia, and you go back over the oxyhemoglobin dissociation relearned it so we know that you did that so the spaced repetition will change based on the fact that you've seen it again and that's one of the added benefits of integrating your class and board prep is it's more contextualized it's not just its own independent system operating outside of your curriculum it actually operates within your curriculum um, i'm going to move on and 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 explain some more things feel free to keep sending questions i'll pause again to answer some of those so the one thing I show you for your class prep was you can click on the actual slide to take notes. There's three other options we give you. So you can click create flashcards, which takes you to the same place. It takes you right into the document where you can then create flashcards and questions. And we recommend that again because it's a it's an active way of learning. Then there's quiz yourself and high yield prep. First, I'm going to show you high yield prep. So in an ideal world, every time you have a lecture in your class, you would, you would click high yield prep before, say the night before or the morning of your lecture. Um, and that's, that's for two reasons. So high yield prep are things that we know are relevant for the boards, that's the term high yield, but also the wards, uh, because ultimately, you know, as I mentioned with the Zika virus, while it may not be tested on the boards anytime soon, it's high yield because you may see a patient who asks you about it. Um, a second reason we, uh, we recommend you do this is you're basically priming yourself. You aren't going to class and sitting in this one hour lecture or media citing it, and, you know, two xing it, making it a 30 minute lecture. You aren't going in blind. You're going in with context. So again, this is development of male and female reproductive system. If I click high yield prep, what we show you on the bottom is we've identified three concepts that are high yield for this. Testosterone, growth hormone, and Turner syndrome, which makes sense given what you're learning. So testosterone will give you the summary, will give you a link to a Medscape article, so you can click there um, and see you know, the mechanism of action of testosterone and, and metabolism and things like that. Uh, you can also click on the Wikipedia. So a lot of you like to use Wikipedia, obviously, and you can get more information about testosterone through Wikipedia. Um, then there's first aid. Again, what, where it shows up in first aid. Then there's the flashcards that you can go through again, and then the timeline. And then once you're done with that, you can click go back here and click to the next topic, which is growth hormone. Do the same thing for growth hormone and then Turner syndrome. So summary, reference articles, flashcards, timeline, and then this is new, we have a pathophysiology video. So you can watch a quick pathophys video. Hello. This is four minutes on Turner syndrome. And if you 2X this, make it two minutes, watch it before the lecture, now when your professor talks about it, you're much more likely to retain that knowledge. Um, and I'll, I'll show you other examples of other resources we, we offer. So there's a, another example is Picmonic. So Picmonic and Sketchy Micro, for example, are resources with visual mnemonics to learn and retain information. These are really uh, useful. So this requires actually a separate subscription, but if you click here, it can take you, if you're logged in, it'll take you directly to the Picmonic card, which allows you to uh, learn and review um, Turner Syndrome. Um, and so the reason you know this is the Turner syndrome pigmonic is that Turner syndrome is represent, represented by a turnip, um, which helps you visualize it and, and retain it later. I'm going to X out of that, 
and click on another one to show you. So this is a lecture on B12 and iron metabolism. If I click high yield prep, now there's 11 flashcards. We recommend that you look at megaloblastic anemia because it showed up nine times in this lecture. So again, this is where we're taking your curricular content, we're uh, extracting all the text, doing natural language processing on it, and then recommending this content. So here's the summary, Wikipedia, uh, Medscape article, um, let me put that down, and the pathophys video on it. I'm um, going to see if there's another good example. Iron oh, here's, here's a good example. Iron deficiency anemia shows up four times in the lecture, which makes sense because this is a lecture on iron metabolism. And you can see this is a Khan Academy video on iron deficiency. But most importantly, I think this is my favorite thing on osmosis to make things clinically relevant. Here's a patient video. So in four minutes, or again, two minutes if you two exit, you can watch uh, a patient describe their symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, which does three things for you. First, it makes you more engaged in the material. After all, that's why you went to med school to eventually help patients. Second is it makes the material more memorable. Um, and that's important because, um, you know, if you ask any physician, um, ask, ask a lecturer uh, who, who's a physician how they remember things. Most of them will say the best way to remember is through actual patients. So by the time you hit the wards, when you see your first patient with, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, acute hepatitis, you'll remember that patient for a long time because they were your patient. This kind of tries getting to the clinical correlation part of that. The third thing it does is it makes you more relatable. You know, instead of using kind of random mnemonics um, for remembering a certain thing like iron deficiency anemia, you have a real patient story that you can relate to. And we've taken this a step further by not just um, offering, you know, um, anonymous patients. These are just, you know, normal patients walking around. Uh, we also have, an, we link to um, famous patient cases. So an example of that is if I click into, you know, um, actually aortic dissection, I think, has a aortic dissection. This is a search engine where you, which you can use. Again, you'll see all the resources in the concept card, which we've collated for you. Here's a patient story about aortic dissection. But then here's something we like a lot called celeb diagnosis. So we have hundreds of questions and, and also article links to celebrities who have these conditions um, and so or had these conditions. So these are written by uh, two physicians, Dr. Boguski and Dr. Berman. And this is an article about John Ritter, who passed away, unfortunately, from an aortic dissection. And so if, if any of you used to like watch, you know, if any of you um, watched uh, Three's Company or Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, you recognize John Ritter, and you can understand more about the condition he had. Same with um, other conditions. So I think preeclampsia has one. Um, oops, it doesn't, it doesn't actually show up here, but I know we have, um, you know, uh, we definitely have a number of them. So Shogun syndrome. And, yeah, so... If any of you are tennis fans, uh, you know Venus and Serena are both in the um, semifinals of the of Wimbledon. It's happening right now. Venus actually is very impressive because she she's uh, overcome Sjogren's syndrome, and so you can learn about Sjogren's syndrome in the context of Venus Williams. And now it isn't just a bunch of random. You know, you've seen these charts where it's a bunch of you know seemingly random symptoms, unless you understand the pathophysiology. Now you understand that. Look, dry eyes. Could, accept, could affect Venus's tennis game, right? That would make it harder for her to focus on the ball. Um, or arthritis and muscle pain certainly would affect her tennis game. So you start drawing these correlations and you become more relatable to your patients. So when you see a patient with Sjogren's syndrome, you can actually mention Venus Williams has it, and now you aren't just kind of citing off a random fact, um, or you're a, you aren't necessarily a bookish med student, you can actually relate to them. So that's why we really like the patient videos and the uh, Celeb DX, is it makes, you, it makes it more memorable, it makes it more um, engaging, and it makes you more relate relatable. Again, that's part of how we balance the, the three curricula problem, where you're learning about Strogan through a PowerPoint. It's obviously important for the board exams, and then there's clinical things you need to know, clinical pearls. Okay, so click High Yield Prep, and use this to hone in on the concepts for your lectures or for your you know, TBLs and PBLs. And, um, and go through the stuff before them, and then you'll get a lot more out of your lectures and be able to see how things relate to each other. Uh, as well as if you click Timeline, here's where uh, it'll load every time megaloblastic anemia shows up in your curriculum, which in this two-month-old curriculum is only once so far. I'm going to see if there's any more questions. Okay, no more questions right now. I'm going to keep going. Um, so 
you know, we've, we've clicked on the document to take notes, we've clicked on create flashcards, and we've gone through high yield prep. The last thing to click on is quiz yourself. So remember that today is July 6th. I'm going to say quiz myself here. And what it takes you is to this next thing, quiz by calendar. And so in another webinar, I'm going to be talking about the importance of testing yourself. But briefly, there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, testing, there's a, something called a testing effect, where relative to repeated studying, testing yourself helps you retain information in a, in a more robust way. Um, and learn it in the first place too. So here you can see this is a quiz is available for this specific document, development of male and female reproductive organs. And you can see that Osmosis has said, hey, we have 42 flashcards from our question, from our 15,000 flashcard bank, all of which are board relevant. We've matched five of these 42 flashcards directly to your document, and that's what I showed you before. There's also stuff that was produced at your school. So nine, nine flashcards produced by my classmates, um, I'm following all nine of them. Let me, let me do something else. So instead of just going doing a deep dive into this document, let's just say it's Saturday. So you've gone through a whole week of material. So it's this, this Saturday, it's the 9th. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the 4th and drag over to the 8th. So I've highlighted five days' worth of material. Osmosis found 381 flashcards that are board relevant based on that week's worth of material. So immediately you have kind of your marching orders. You can do these hopefully on a daily basis so it doesn't seem like that much, but going through flashcards is really quick. Um, 258 of these are already are very board relevant, uh, or very relevant to your classes because they were matched directly to documents, and 78, 78 of these are things I've already flagged. Your classmates also have produced 196 flashcards, and my study group, say the people I'm following, have produced 22 of those. And I can create a quiz with any of these things. And then my favorite, and again, this is how you integrate board studying with class studying, is at the end of your one week's worth of material, it would be great if you could quiz yourself on board relevant board style questions. So we found in our bank of, we have over 7,500 um, step one and step two practice questions um, and 450 OMM questions for the osteopathic students who are watching this. Um, and we're trying to increase our complex um, um, participation as well. You can click 27 questions here and build a quiz. And so remember, at the end of the week, I've just done this. And now you have a clinical vignette. So you'll notice this is a style of a clinical question that's, that's based on concepts that I covered this past week. Now, these still may be very hard to answer, but um, it's important to get in the habit of trying to answer them because uh, ultimately, you will have to take a really important test that looks like this, that, that has a bunch of questions that look like this. And so it would be good to get yourself in the habit. And so here is a clinical vignette. Oftentimes, it's a two-step question. Um, and so I'm going to just select a choice. On osmosis, you have to rate your confidence before answering the question. And that's by design. That's actually a, a pretty innovative and new approach that I think is, um, is really useful to, to incorporate. And then you can say, you know, I'm just going to guess here. I'm going to say no clue. You know, I was wrong. It was subdural hematoma. And this is another example. So it's based, you know, we'll say, you know, Ann Davis, who was on the Brady Bunch, actually um, passed away from a subdural hematoma. So there's an, another example of a clinical correlation. And you can read more about it, uh, and then there'll be a clinical takeaway often or a major takeaway, which helps you really hone in on the main point here. Um, we'll also recommend on the right other things. So the answer was subdural hematoma. So we recommend the Medscape articles on subdural hematoma, which you can read. We recommend the Pygmonic. You know, Ann Davis has talked about. Apparently, um, so stroke was one of the choices here. Stroke was wrong, but we still say you know there's a the basis for uh, Mumford and Sons apparently has had had a stroke. I guess um, that's too bad. I really like his music, but <clears throat> you can you can click uh, click around too. And so if you don't know what um, you know altered mental status is, you can click on that, and we'll get you the concept card. So again, I think one thing people like the most about this is it takes your three curricula, your class studying, your board studying, and your clinical vignettes, you know, lab values here, for example, and it puts them all into one platform that lets you seamlessly go between the material and draw correlations. Um, again, one of my things that I can't stress enough is if you click on subdural hematoma and you get all these resources, um, it'll say subdural hematoma is page 469 of first aid. And who knew? Alcoholism is. Um, related to subdural hematoma, page 523, you can understand kind of what that link is. Um, so a super cool way to understand um, 
under you know, to learn more. And actually, I may have misspoke. I don't. I guess the Mumford and Sons guy didn't have a stroke. Maybe he did have a subdural hematoma. Let's see. I'm just curious. Anyways, I can read about this later. But so this is what I'm talking about, where it'll help you kind of get more context. Some of you may be asking yourself, "Oh wow, there's a lot of stuff here. How am I going to really do all these videos and all these reference articles and all these you know first aid page numbers?" The point is not to do all of them. The point is to do what works for you. And actually, we want to add a feature that lets you unsubscribe from certain things. That being said, even in passing, just seeing something that grabs your attention, once you once you you know remember reading about Ann Davis and her subdural hematoma and the fact that she was on the Brady Bunch, um, you know that will help you remember the concept of subdural hematoma longer. So even though it may take a few more minutes up front to learn the material, once you've learned it. It's with you longer, so that you can kind of escape these cram forget cycles. Anyway, so I'll go to the next question. Here's another clinical vignette type question. I'm going to answer it. You can see the explanation. There's some references, and you can keep going. And so, how did we get here? We got here from under lectures. We went to quiz by calendar, and then you select the dates you want to answer, and then you can also pick the um, the the quizzes you want. And so, one other thing I'll show you is the quizzes from your school. So <clears throat> there's flashcards from school as well as questions from school. In this case, there's only flashcards. Or actually, there's one question from my school here, too. If I build a quiz from my classmates' material, I can select, you know, I, there's a lot of filters. I can filter many different things here, start the quiz. So here are those keyboard shortcuts so you can get through flashcards really quickly. I'm going to answer the question. I got it um, with high confidence, so now it's going to come back to me later. You can see my classmate Ricky wrote this flashcard. And unlike Anki, unlike Quizlet, and unlike any other system that exists right now for this kind of thing, one thing that Osmosis does really well is that it takes this material, which came from Ricky, and shows me the lecture slide that Ricky wrote this on. And if I click on it, I can go right back to the curricular document for that lecture slide, uh, that lecture slide specifically. Um, my internet's a little slow, so it's taking a little while longer to load because um, I'm doing this webinar. But you can see here's the lecture slide. Oops, and a lot of questions have been answered, have been written about this. And that means you can feel comfortable in Ricky's information. If you don't feel comfortable, you can comment on it and you can say, you know, I want to add a mnemonic or it's not correct, has a typo. And in this case, in this way, it's kind of like Facebook. And remember, if you remember how we started this article, What Can Medical Education Learn from Facebook and Netflix? We've basically incorporated some of those social networking features here. So you can comment on Ricky's stuff, and this is what it looks like, just like your Facebook notifications. There's a notifications on osmosis. You can see that my classmate Vince created a flashcard, and then my other classmate Aman posted additional info. And you know, he's nice cards, Vince. Can you also describe this? And Aman, if you're if you're listening, which I think you RSVP'd for this, I apologize for for calling you out here, but um, I think that's great. I think that's great to support each other, and and you know, you're all working towards the same goal of getting through med school, you know, climbing this mountain. And I think it's a lot easier when you know that other people have your back. So I think that's great. <clears throat> okay. So we just went through your curricular material, the board relevant recommendations, the ability to quiz yourself early and often. Now I want to zoom out and show you a couple more things that will help you for uh, you know, board prep and, and clinical prep. So if you just want to go and do a deep dive in questions you know, and you just want to test yourself on board questions, as I mentioned, we actually have the largest question bank available for step one and step two. We have over 15,000 flashcards. and. More importantly, 7,500 clinical vignette-based questions. These are multiple choice questions, very high, high yield. And so you can see, for example, we have 579 step one neurology questions that you can access, or 113 hemon questions. And as you go down, you can see we also have a bunch of step two questions. So this is one way to, to you know, if you just want to manually go in and say, hey, I really want to answer some neuro questions, you can go there and, and build a quiz for that. Um, however, we recommend following along with your coursework because it's just more relevant and more engaging that way. So that's one thing. And then there's also this library. So say you don't have course documents, say you're on spring break or you're on summer, um, you can still go in and, and learn a lot um, by covering, by, by basically trying to fill out this, this map we've created for you. So say it's cardiovascular. We've basically you know, summarized cardiovascular into pathology and pharmacology. We're adding physiology this month too. And these are categorized under chapters, we call them, right? So acute disease, chronic disease. Under acute, there's a couple of different headers. And then each one of these is a concept card. And so you can quiz yourself with a flashcard quiz on acute coronary syndromes 
or you can do a chapter quiz on acute cardiovascular disease, or you can do flashcard or question quiz for the entire cardiovascular subject. And as, as before, you can click on something and then go do a deep dive into that concept. So you can benefit even without your course material, you can benefit from, by using just this library and just using the search engine. Type in vasculitis, and I can go right there and see you know, a patient with vasculitis in a Khan Academy video. One thing I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, didn't uh, say is, so we mentioned Khan Academy a lot. One reason we do that is obviously a lot of you use that in undergrad um, and high school. Uh, but also, more importantly, more recently, the uh, Khan Academy Medicine team joined Osmosis. So our team pretty much doubled when they joined us, and now we're producing our own videos that aren't in this style, that are actually um, pretty well reviewed. So if you click on like MI, for example, we have this video here on heart attack that goes into more detail than um, Khan Academy would. According to the World Health Organization, and heart attacks happen when there's a sudden oh damage starts to. You can essentially kind of skip through and see it, um, and it's a little more detailed than Khan Academy. It's cleaner, and there's sound effects, and uh, in many cases, we're collaborating with organizations like Kaiser Permanente and Rush to create these. One of the coolest things is if you actually Google myocardial infarction, you know, Wikipedia is one of the first things that show, shows up. It's number three. You scroll down, and you can actually see our, our videos here on Wikipedia. Um, and that's because we have a collaboration with them where we produce a lot of free and open content. So one nice thing is any school or student who, who subscribes to the entire Osmosis platform is helping us fund the creation of these open videos that, that are being translated into 10 different languages. Um, so our Zika virus video, for example, is actually in translated into Portuguese, um, So which makes obvious sense because Brazil is still an epicenter for that. Um, and you can watch our Zika virus video, understand Zika virus. And, um, and know that it's going to help patients and, and clinicians in other countries also learn about those concepts. So anyways, we have a bunch of videos that are, that are exist, uh, about 100 videos. We're trying to produce hundreds more. And, um, and your participation on Osmosis really helps us do that. So we appreciate that. Um, OK, just wrapping up, because um, I know I've, we've talked a lot about how to integrate your class studying with board studying, just to reiterate. I'm sorry if it's getting. Uh, to be reiterated too much for many of you who've been on since the beginning, but for those of you who joined kind of late, you know, we went through how to go into a private curricular group, in this case, Ross's May class, and balance all the curricular material that you're expected to learn with the high yield prep, the board board related material that you're expected to learn. So no longer do you have to completely skip curricular activities to study pathoma. You basically can use osmosis to bridge the divide between those two things more effectively. Now, two, two more things just to mention um, while we're talking about some board prep stuff. One is a video that uh, Dr. Desai, who used to run Khan Academy and now is our chief medical officer, created. Hi, my name is some of you may have seen this. And he basically goes through um, how to prepare for step one. Um, I'll definitely share this on the link if, if any of you want to watch that. Definitely recommend it, especially for the rising M2s and M3s who haven't taken step yet. Um, in it, he describes this one feature that we have. If you go to step one mode, we have this schedule that this is less about balancing class and board prep. This is more about once you're done with classes and you have your two to eight weeks of dedicated board studying, you can literally go in and create a study plan where you can say how long you want to, uh, when do you want to start studying, how long you want to spend in dedicated study mode, and when do you actually take the exam. And we're going to add a complex version of this as well. And you can see, you know, here's the study plan summarized. There's a timeline. So I started mine on July 6th, um, and I want to start with, say, you know, behavioral science. And I want to spend two days on behavioral science. So you can totally customize how you want to do things. You can also pick what resources you want to use, and we're continuously trying to add more resources. But we chose some really high-yield ones here, including UWorld, First Aid, Pathoma, and obviously Osmosis is 15,000 flashcards and 7,500 case questions. Um, and literally, in the here you'll see a daily list. So on July 8th and 9th, you're supposed to do, you know, reading these pages of first aid, watch these videos in Pathoma, do these flashcards on osmosis and questions, and then there's 23 UWorld immunology related questions you can do. Um, and then you can also keep track of your progress on the practice exams from the NBME and UWorld. Um, this is all really useful to, to kind of keep track of your studying and make sure that, you know, again, if you've used the system the way it's supposed to be used, 
during your preclinical curriculum, your, your first year to two years of med school, this will be less important because you've remembered the material you learned and you've bridged that divide between board and class prep. However, in the event that you do feel like you need extra help, this helps you really organize all your, um, your entire studying schedule. And we also have something like that for, um, for clinical rotations where it's less granular, but essentially once you get to third year and start doing, or second year for some of you, and you start doing your core clerkships, you can say when you start your medicine rotation, when you take your shelf, surgery, pediatrics, et cetera. And down here, we'll develop this map for you. So, you know, I started med school in 2015. I expect to graduate 2019. It'll give you a couple of years here. And you can see I was in preclinical mode right here. But now I'm entering, you know, pediatrics over here, psychiatry over there, ob guy over there. And essentially what Osmosis will do is our app will send you a board style, a shelf style or, or step two style question um, for, for pediatrics during pediatrics. So you don't have to spend as much time managing and going between resources. It just is kind of you get a push notification to your phone with a pediatrics question. It helps you keep, keep on top of studying. One of my favorite articles um, that was ever written about osmosis is, um, is this one, which I'll also post. It's the app that manages med school for you. And that's essentially what we were trying to go for here when we developed this as medical students at Johns Hopkins, which is we wanted to make sure that we could spend less time managing all the resources we were given, whether it was the professor's PowerPoint slide or it was a, um, you know, a pathoma video or first aid, the book. Um, we want to spend less time kind of going between and managing all these resources and more time just learning. Um, and so the nice thing here is, is I think we've, we've, you know, most students who use osmosis and you probably have a number at your school who do, who you can talk to say the same thing is that literally instead of, instead of, if you don't know a concept, instead of going, opening up a new tab and, and Googling it and saying, you know, what is diabetic ret ret retinopathy? You know, which would ultimately will wind up taking you to you know, an NIH or AOA or, or you know, more often than not, Wikipedia. Just just use our uh, abil our um, search engine here. We're not Oops. Actually, I'm I'm going to go just to diabetes. It's easier. It's diabetes and syphilis. So you can you know get all the all the material here high yield too. And if you just want to use Wikipedia, you can get it here too. So with that, um, you know, there's a lot more. There's a whole app that I that I really haven't shown, but you can check it out. Um, just to summarize. You know, from our experience as med students, osmosis is run by medical students and by physicians. So we've all been through this before. You know, we aren't, um, you know, we, we basically built this thing just for ourselves and our classmates. And then students at other schools wanted to use it, one, to help them with learning and retaining information, and two, with helping them focus on what's relevant and managing their uh, studying. And so <clears throat> just going back to how we started, you know, this next four years, if you're just starting med school, are going to be fairly challenging because you have these three curricula. You have to learn things for your classes. You have to ace these board exams to get into residency. And you have to obviously, you know, know how to be a good physician. So you get the clinical experience. And the best schools manage to kind of make a very good overlap between all three. But just by nature, there are things that won't overlap. And so the ideal um, workflow, whether you use osmosis or not, the ideal workflow for you to, to get into is being able to bridge that divide between, you know, when you have a lecture on telomeres given by your PhD faculty member, being able to kind of hone in and realize that telomeres um, does show up on step one and is important for clinical, um, for uh, clinically with, with in some cases. So you're able to really draw um, associations between these three different curricula and in the process become a more well-rounded and educated clinician and also learn how to steward your own knowledge and go between resources. So we're a little early, which is good. Um, I'm happy to take questions. You can always email hi at osmosis.org or go on the bottom right here and click on the question mark and then start a question, start a chat with us. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think we'll end here. But I just wanted to thank all of you for your time and, again, encourage you to uh, contact us with any other questions. Thanks a lot. Have a good, uh, have a good rest of your week and best of luck with med school.